you know, I feel like my life's in danger because like, because like, you know, the, he, he said that the laws that were in California would make a victim have like a million dollars or something or a couple million and they should have that because it takes a hell of a lot to get your innocence back and feel vindicated when it's been hid by the institutions that are supposed to protect you and love you. And he said that not in his lifetime would the statute of the church had such control over the laws in Utah to, to keep victims from coming forward that not in his lifetime would that change. The, the, that because of the statutes, they could never come forward. And, and I, as a victim, and I know that the craziness leaves you when you're validated and the bad people are held responsible. And, and when, uh, uh, in my book now, if you, a pedophile is bad, but if you're an institution hiding it, you're just as bad, especially if you're doing it to thousands and thousands of people for money. And, and, and the thing about Tim is just that like, or, he says not in his lifetime, they, they, they get the church would pay twenty or $40,000 after sending someone through hell for coming forward. And I and I seen I seen online on Facebook the this this thing that said like if you're if you're a victim of abuse in the Mormon Church, you know con, you know th those people they they wanted me to sign up they were going to sell my rights as a victim of abuse in the Mormon Church to some more to, they they just sell them really quickly to to another attorney and then these people they, they it was it looked like they would just lose a case and then I could never retry my case I could never be validated. If, if they just got all the victims in Utah to fill up with this and sign their rights away to cases that were dead-end cases, then the church legally wouldn't have to deal with all these victims that they have. They had a third of the membership of Boy Scouts of America. They had the liability of meeting in, in, in undisclosed meetings with the church. Man, I, I even found out that the unorthodox to the church, Mormon church practice, if victims came forward, and the, the I think Elder Helam was over this, the helping of the church handbook. The church handbook developed in the 1990s and 2000s. Originally in the scriptures, bishops would be judges in Israel following promptings on how to handle cases, but now they had very specific instructions on exactly what to do as this institutionalization of the faith began. And in these instructions, if there was any kind of child abuse allegations or anything, they called these people a support line that was like attorneys talking to them on what to do. And unbeknownst to the members of the church, these people were designed, they were ordained as bishops so that the church legally wouldn't have to let any respond, be responsible for reporting any of the child abuse that went. And these sharp, smart people in the law firm, I think they were in the, the bishops, were in the same building as McConkie and in the Kurt law McConkie, firm. Yeah. And we've covered... Welcome back, everybody, for the second episode of the David Hamblin K-Series. If you did not watch the first part, part one, episode one, stop everything that you're doing right now and head on over there, watch it because you don't want to miss any of the details. In this case, before we dive into the meat of everything that's going on with the David Hamblin case. One thing I'll say before we, we dive into the second part of this, uh, you know, the first episode, I kind of went into one of the victim statements that starts discussing that there is this secret LDS Church of Satan that's operating within the LDS Mormon Church. I went into some of their belief systems, um, their obsession with bloodlines, uh, why that's so important. I also went into the historical aspects of the, the Mormon religion, which includes incestuous marriages, uh, child abuse, polygamy, and, and all of these things that they believe are biblically correct. The only reason why they have not been practicing polygamy, well, some do, but it's because it's illegal, um, but that their faith has a foundation and belief in this polygamous merit or this polygamous lifestyle, um, and incest is part of that. If you look up Adam Paul Steed, he plays a intricate role in the downfall of the Boy Scouts, uh, you know, how there was 
I don't know if people remember this, but in the Boy Scouts, there was this uh, period of time where all these victims in the Boy Scouts, you know, all across the nation, I think there was like 87,000 reported cases when this, you know, all came out that there were people being abused within the Boy Scout community. And one third of the Boy Scout community were LDS. And the LDS interwove themselves in this huge thing. And there's a new documentary series out. But Adam Paul Steed was a huge reason why there was a big downfall in the Boy Scouts because he was a whistleblower and he had been abused for a really long time. And he was the one who started this whole thing. And he was the one who actually changed the legislation in Utah that, um, you know, victims couldn't come forth after a five year period of time. Even for children, it was like, okay, well, if children didn't come out and say that they were abused within that five, five year period, nothing could have been done about it. And so he was the one who actually implemented and changed the legislation in Utah so that victims could come forth later in life. So he was a big thing. And that was the guy who was talking in the beginning of this video. But I had mentioned in my last video, the Ruby Frank story, the eight passengers mom, and how I felt like this had been tied to this story a little bit because there was a lot of parallels to the David Hamblin case. And so I've been paying a lot of attention to that. And as I've been uncovering stuff, I'll share it with you guys too, as I'm going along this case. But that interview that he was giving, he was actually talking about how he was abused and how Jody Hildebrandt, which is the other woman in this Ruby Frank case, both of the women got arrested. Jody Hildebrandt was a, a therapist and all of a sudden now all these victims are coming forth of being victimized by Jody Hildebrandt. And, uh, you know, this has to do with the LDS religion because uh, most of the people who, well, actually every single person who was referred to Jody Hildebrandt for therapy, marriage counseling, addictions, all these things that were the same thing that David Hamblin was doing. You know, all these bishops would refer people within the LDS church to these therapists. Jody Hildebrandt was one of them. Okay. And the more I'm diving into that, Ruby Frank, a lot of people are giving Ruby Frank, you know, the, the limelight, but Jody Hildebrandt is a monster, like a monster. It's unbelievable, unbelievable the psychological tactics that she would use on her clients to put husband and wife against each other, um, to make people believe that they had all of these addictions that they didn't have. They would turn; pe she would turn people against themselves and make them believe that they were dangerous in society. The more victims that are coming out in that case, it just reminds me of this David Hamlin case. So I would highly suggest you guys to, to watch or listen to the, it's a five hour long interview. And there's even more because there was another uh, woman who was the niece of Jody Hildebrandt. And she explained a lot of the things that she went through under the care of Jody Hildebrandt as well, which just had so many parallels to this case, the David Hamlin case. So I highly suggest you guys go and listen to that. Let me show you what it is. <clears throat> so this is the one that you guys should listen to. By the way, this is only going to be a 15 minute preview. If you're watching on YouTube, you can watch the full episode on my premium Rockfin channel, rockfin.com forward slash chiller queen podcast. If you want to listen to this entire series, full episodes, I'll put a link in the show notes. So this is what I'm talking about. Um, if you go to Mormon stories, I love Mormon stories. Really, really great information about the Mormon religion um, and how much corruption is in it. But this is the this is the one that I'm talking about. Mormon stories. Eight passengers, mom, therapist Jody Hildebrandt destroyed my life with special guest Adam Paul Steed. Five hour long interview. Definitely listen to it because if you're going along with this case with me, 
you're going to see so many parallels in people, powerful people talked about across the board who might potentially be a part of this LDS Church of Satan that these victims in the David Hamlin case had been talking about and outlining what they do, what their roles are, the positions that they play in the Mormon religion, the LDS church, the Native American church. There's a lot of parallels and connections in people that I feel like this is uh this is a huge spider web and it's going to be a lot to cover. So um hold on, let me let me show you this too. I'll show you. What am I doing here? Like I told you, not very tech savvy. Okay, so he has a lot of stories, uh, Mormon stories, on this eight passengers person, but or the Ruby Frank, Frank story. This is the other one I highly suggest you guys watch. It's niece of eight passengers mom therapist Jody Hildebrandt speaks out. Jesse Hildebrandt. It's episode one eight zero eight guys are interested in that that's a three hour long conversation check that out without further ado we are going to get into this uh this david hamlin case here here <laughs> okay All right, so we are continuing, like I said, everything that we covered last time. Why aren't you sharing? Okay, one second. Give me a second here. There we go. We're almost there, guys. We're doing it. We're doing it. Thanks for uh, bearing with me here. All right, so like I said, put the put together a PowerPoint for you guys. You guys can read along with me and we'll just continue from the last one. Now, we're going to go into kind of like the people who have been accused in the victims statements. We're going to kind of try, try to tie some of the dots together that this doesn't just include David Hamblin and his wife. This includes a lot of people and this is going to start breaking down how the operations of this organization work within the LDS church and how they have gotten away for so long abusing victims and that's still going on and I feel like the more that these victims are getting caught like the Ruby Frank person the Jody Hildebrandt they're getting the only reason why they got caught was because one of the kids escaped Jody Hildebrandt's house with duct tape around its ankles and hands and it was starved or the child was starved and ran to a neighbor's house asking for food the child actually thought that it was his fault cuz he told the man when he was when the when the kid was being interviewed the child told them that it was his fault that he, you know, had wasn't able to eat and that he was in the position that he was. Like, that's how much manipulation and brainwash that these adults put into the abusers' minds. And it's crazy to think about, but these people are raised in this type of, of environment, making themselves believe that they are the ones who aren't doing God's will or that they're the ones who are doing things wrong and this is their punishment and that it's okay. But as we go along, this, this mind control, this ability to manipulate and control the minds of their victims, this is how they've been getting away with it for so long. We're going to connect the dots on how this, how they've been getting away with this for so long. So let's talk about David Hamlin first, because he is the central figure in this whole story. Um, he was part of the LDS church and he's the one who gained a lot of no notoriety that's going on right now. Okay. Hopefully as the story unfolds, we're going to see a lot more arrests happen, especially with some of the people that are named in here. But unfortunately, as you see, as we go along, there are a lot of 
things that the LDS have put into positions to cover their tracks to not be prosecuted. So we may not see that happen, but we hope that that happens. David Hamblin was a psychologist. He graduated in Arizona and he went to work in New York at Cornell Medical Center. Um, the victim statements stated that the abuse had lasted for over two decades and spanned across at least four states. So as the family had moved, obviously the abuse had spanned throughout that entire time. Um, the victims alleged that they were transported around Utah as well as other, you know, three other states for the purpose of sexual abuse by family members and other members of the Church of Satan. So these people weren't selling their children to people outside of the church. They were doing this inside of this very organized, set up LDS Church of Satan group. And remember, this has a very strong generational family component to it. It's very, uh, you know, the LDS Church of Satan is very much into polygamy, incest, and keeping bloodlines pure. And so everything is done within the organization itself. Now, we'll talk about David Hamlin's daughters because in the victim statements, um, everything, there's a lot of redactions of names, but through a lot of like investigation and kind of piecing some of the dots together, we're able to come up with a lot of the names that these people are talking about. And it's very clear from the police reports that it was Hamlin's daughters who originally reported the abuse. They went public in 2012. That was the first time that David Hamblin actually got arrested. And unfortunately in 2012, when the girls started remembering a lot of the memories of the abuse, because remember they were psychologically controlled. They David Hamblin would administer severe psychological and physical abuse onto his daughters where he would disassociate aspects of their brain so that they would forget different parts of their personality. So he would create these different personalities in their brain and these personalities would forget because it was just the brain's way of coping with the reality in which they were living in. And so as these memories started to come back, the, the children were starting to piece together that these weren't just false memories. Maybe some of them were false memories that were planted within their brain and didn't actually happen. But all these memories that were coming back to them and they didn't understand, when the daughters actually came together and were like, I think I was abused when I was younger. Tell me about, and then the other child's like, or now they're adults, but they were saying, oh, well, I think I was too. And then they started talking about the abuse that they were remembering and it was similar to each other and that's when they realized that oh my gosh we have been abused because why does our stories align why do we have the same memories and unfortunately at that time it was very fragmented and so when they came out and they told the police and gave their reports the police didn't really have much to go on because the stories were fragmented they didn't have the whole picture and it also lacked a lot of evidence at that time. So at that time, they dismissed the case without prejudice, meaning that they could open the case at a future date if they got enough evidence. But the odd part about that too, is that during that investigation, David Hamblin, so the police were trying to gather evidence on the case and because they couldn't find physical evidence, they wanted to see if they could set the daughters up with a voice recording to try and get a confession from the mother and the father because they accused both mom and dad of physically abusing them. When they confronted David Hamblin, this was back in 2012, okay? This is the evidence that they had in 2012 and they still didn't convict. He apologized for for raping 
or I don't even know if I could say that. He apologized for abusing them, but also stated that it wasn't him who did it. It was whoever was in his body that was doing it. He blamed it on, he said, he kept saying like, I didn't say that I didn't do it, but it wasn't me. It was basically like he would dance around the fact that yes, I did do it, but it also wasn't me. I can't say that I did do it. I can't say that I didn't do it, but it wasn't me at the time. And so, you know, he had admitted on video that this had happened, but that it wasn't him. It was some dark force within him that did it. And he still didn't go to jail. And then he even tried to fight later to get this whole thing, like his his name cleared from this whole thing in the court system. And the court system was like, no, no, because this has evidence that this could potentially be something. And then, you know, years later, he ends up getting arrested again. So they were the original ones in 2012. David, you know, gets out of jail and he continues his life, but more victims who start remembering these things come forward and say that they're victims of David Hamblin after they had heard of the reports from David Hamblin's daughters. That's when Brett Bluth, I did a video on his statement, which you can watch right now, um, but he had stated he came out because of their reports he wanted to give credibility to their reports. And so that's the reason why he came out and then more victims began coming out. Coming out. The accusations in their reports were obviously not just about David, but it included David's wife, Rosie or Brazil. When the daughters tried to get their mother to admit on camera that, that she had abused them, I have the videos. And I'll, I'll try to get those uploaded onto here. Um, it's really hard to get those videos. But she, this is what Rizelle said. She said, I don't remember doing absolutely any of that. That doesn't seem like something that I would do. And the amount of abuse in the victim statements from her, you would be like, how does she not remember that? Well, she had stated, you know, David Hamlin was really good at mental manipulation.